Hi, Chris. Having any luck on that hard starting problem? It takes more than luck, Phil. It takes careful workmanship and attention to details. Now, I'd like to show you something. Hey, what's the idea? <laughs> oh, I just wanted to prove something to you. Get in and start the car while I keep this hose on the distributor. Okay, Houdini. I'll try it, but... Well, I'll be... What's your magic formula? Dependable starting is the result of making sure everything in the starting, ignition, and fuel systems is in good condition. And don't forget that compression must be okay, too. Good point, Tech. Now, I start by making sure the battery is in good condition, fully charged and big enough to do its job. If a new battery is needed, always recommend the specified Mopar or Cryco replacement. In some cases, it's a good idea to suggest a battery of even larger capacity. We do that, Tech, and we point out to the owner that underpowered, so-called bargain batteries, don't have the capacity to ensure good cranking speed and a hot spark, especially in extremely cold weather when battery output can be cut by as much as half. A combination of dirt, corrosion, and acid on the battery can cause self-discharge. So, if necessary, I remove the battery and scrub it with plain baking soda or ammonia in warm water. Just be sure you don't get any of that cleaning solution in the battery. Yes, that's important. It's also important to clean the battery posts and starting motor cable terminals. Replace any damaged or corroded clamp bolts that might prevent proper tightening of the clamps. Sometimes winter driving conditions can really build up deposits on the terminals, can't they? Right. And electrical connections have to be clean and tight to prevent high resistance that cuts down the electrical energy available for cranking and ignition. If the battery is fully charged, but cranking speed is slow, I test the starting motor and starting circuit. Our starting motors will do an excellent job of cranking the engine, even in sub-zero temperature, if the starting circuit's okay. If the starting motor checks out, what's next? After I'm sure the entire cranking system is okay, I check the ignition system. I begin by making sure all ignition primary circuit connections are clean and tight. The primary terminals must be properly positioned. If they touch the coil tower, they may short out the secondary in wet weather. Also, make sure the distributor primary lead grommet is in place. That grommet keeps out road splash. Besides, if the grommet's pulled out, the primary lead may kink and short out inside the distributor. I'll keep those points in mind, Chris. Now, can you tell me what causes carbon tracking? Sure thing, Phil. Moisture has a tendency to condense on the inside of the distributor cap and attract dirt and dust. That is the beginning of carbon tracking. Here's what happens next. The high-voltage secondary current jumping from the rotor to the cap electrodes tends to burn the dust or dirt, leaving carbon. And carbon is a conductor of electricity. Eventually, this carbon forms a conductive track between adjacent electrodes, which leads to cross-firing. In a short while, the insulation between the electrodes breaks down, leaving a permanent carbon track. Then, cross-firing will increase. Carbon tracking will cause hard starting, and in time, will cause a constant skip or miss in the engine. In extreme cases, it can even damage a piston, since it may fire a cylinder just as the piston is starting up on its compression stroke. Incidentally, the higher secondary voltage requirements of our modern high-compression, high-speed engines makes distributor cap cleanliness very important. On our six-cylinder distributor, the narrow rotor conductor is always lined up with and close to one of the wide electrodes when the coil discharges its high secondary voltage. This arrangement minimizes carbon tracking and cross-firing. Does this eliminate the need for cleaning the cap? Not by a long shot, Phil. You still have to clean the cap periodically to prevent carbon tracking. 10,000 miles is the recommended interval. Just how often it's necessary depends on the car's mileage and type of driving. Yeah, but suppose the cap looks clean. Is it still necessary to do this job? You bet it is, Phil. Even a slight film of contamination can act as a conductor and cause hard starting. I suppose it's important to remove all oxide and crust from the cap electrodes, isn't it? 
No, Phil, that's not necessary. In fact, you might scratch the cap and provide a foothold for carbon tracking to start. I'll remember that, Tech. If the cap isn't carbon tracked or cracked, I clean it with a regular household detergent mixed with warm water according to the instructions on the label. It's important to use a non-flammable type of detergent. Detergents with a combustible ingredient will leave a conductive residue on the cap. The same precaution holds true for your usual shop solvents, so don't use them either. I scrubbed the cap thoroughly inside and out. For a scrub brush, I took a new one-inch paintbrush and trimmed the bristles down to about half their length to get a better scrubbing action. Rinse the cap with clean hot water to get rid of all traces of detergent suds. Then, shake off the excess water and let the cap air dry. Don't wipe the cap with a shop cloth or dry it with compressed air. That makes good sense. Compressed air or a cloth may often have traces of oil or moisture that could cause the same problem all over again. You're right, Phil. I always clean the inside of the towers, too. The eraser end of a pencil is just the right size for cleaning them out. And by the way, if anyone tries to tell you that a distributor cap should have a vent hole drilled in it, don't you believe it. The distributor itself is vented, and a hole in the cap might let in road splash. Always remove the distributor to install points, so you can check the advance curve, spring tension, and align and gap the points accurately. To align points, bend the stationary contact. Never bend the movable point or arm, and keep the contact faces absolutely clean. While you're at it, I imagine it's a good idea to lubricate the cam so the rubbing block won't wear excessively. That's right, but be sure you clean the cam first. Then use the correct cam lubricant, and not too much of it. If you install breaker points carefully and keep them adjusted and the cam lubricated, they'll last a long time. Our ventilated points have less tendency to burn or pit. Whenever you replace the points, shouldn't you also install a new condenser? That's seldom necessary, Phil. If a car can be started, you can bet the condenser is okay. Chances are the points failed because of normal wear or neglected service, not because of failure of the condenser. The condenser has an extremely long service life. Well, that takes care of the distributor. Now what's next? Right now, I've got a tip on starting that has nothing to do with the ignition system. Somebody better start playing the other side of his record. Okay, Chris. After you've checked the ignition primary circuit, and clean the distributor cap, what's your next step? The secondary circuit comes next, Phil. First, I wipe the coil tower with a clean cloth. Road grime, especially salt, acts as a conductor when moist. This can short out the high tension lead. Incidentally, road salt on the outside of the distributor cap can cause cross-firing for the same reason. Then, I wipe the spark plug cables and coil high tension cable with a clean cloth to remove oil and moisture, and I make sure the insulation isn't worn or cracked. I check the cable insulating nipples and spark plug seals or covers for damage and hardening. If the insulation on any part of the secondary circuit isn't in good shape, it'll collect and hold moisture and short out the ignition. Many of our V8s have spark plug cables with special heat resistant jackets and nylon positioners that keep the cables away from the hot exhaust manifolds. Be sure these cables are routed correctly in the positioners, because excessive heat causes the cable insulation to harden and crack. Use an adapter to attach the timing light. Never use a timing light connector that punctures the insulation of a spark plug cable, boot, or nipples. That's a good point, Tech. Even a tiny hole in the insulation can short out the ignition. On past model cars that have the earlier type of cable nipples at the distributor cap, I replace them with the present type of Mopar or Crico nipples and coil high tension cable package for better sealing. Above all, never pull directly on a high tension cable to disconnect it, where you'll damage the non-metallic core and increase its resistance. Instead, twist the nipple or boot slightly to break the adhesion then pull outward on the nipple or boot. I'd like to mention another precaution. 
If you have to replace the resistor type cables, never use metal core cables. The entire ignition system is designed around these non-metallic resistor core cables. So you're asking for trouble with any other type of cable. Thanks for reviewing all those precautions. Sometimes it's easy to forget those points. Now, what about the coil? A coil is very seldom the cause of hard starting. That's why I never replace a coil until I've checked the entire primary circuit, including the condenser, points, ballast resistor, and all connections. I clean and gap the plugs, or if necessary, replace them. Spark plugs that aren't in good condition can cause hard starting, especially in cold or damp weather. What are your ideas on installing hotter or colder spark plugs? Unless you know the car, the customer, and are sure of how the car is driven, experimenting with unauthorized heat ranges can be mighty risky business. And tell them why, Chris. Spark plugs that are too cold, colder than the recommended heat range, are apt to foul after a relatively few miles of low speed driving. This, of course, leads to misfiring, poor performance, and poor economy. On the other hand, a plug that's too hot contributes to pre-ignition and can cause piston damage. What's more, plugs that are too hot are usually doomed to blistered or burned porcelains and early failure. In other words, use the right type of plug in the recommended heat range. That's the surest way to avoid unnecessary spark plug trouble. Any more ignition system questions, Phil? Hmm, let's see now. Primary circuit, distributor in a cap, coil, secondary cables, spark plugs. I'd say we covered the ignition system pretty thoroughly. Now, what about carburation? Well, Phil, if the problem is confined to hard starting in wet weather, it's a good bet that bringing the cranking and ignition systems up to par will correct the trouble. But if hard starting in cold weather is the problem, it's wise to also check carburation after you're sure the cranking and ignition systems are OK. I usually start with the choke. First, I make sure that the choke is set to specifications and that the linkage is clean and not binding. Don't lubricate the choke linkage. Dirt will stick to the lubricant and soon cause sticking and binding. On every job, I squirt carburetor cleaner into the choke piston cylinder and choke shaft bushings to flush out gum deposits that could cause the choke to stick open. All of our 1964 chokes have a vacuum diaphragm instead of a vacuum piston to eliminate this problem. That's right. But it's still a good idea to flush out the choke shaft bushings occasionally to prevent gum from binding the shaft. To see if the carburetor cleaner has done its job, park the car out in the coal long enough to chill it thoroughly. Then, open the throttle to release the choke and see if the choke valve closes. If the choke still doesn't close, remove the choke piston. Clean the piston, the cylinder, and the shaft bushings with carburetor cleaner. Incidentally, on a torque flight equipped car, don't forget to check the adjustment of the transmission throttle linkage any time you remove or adjust the carburetor. Don't worry, Tech. I always do. Now tell me, could a badly clogged carburetor air filter cause hard starting? It could, Phil, but it's not very likely. Chances are the owner will bring the car in with a performance or economy complaint long before the filters clog bad enough to affect starting. However, it is important to clean or replace the filter as recommended by certified car care. When you clean a carburetor air filter, remember to always blow air through it from the inside. Don't ever blow air from the outside or you'll push dirt into the filter element. When you replace a carburetor air filter, use only a Mopar or Crico replacement filter. The edges of these filters will seal properly against the air filter case and cover to prevent unfiltered air from leaking into the carburetor. That's more than you can say for some off-brand filters. Good point, Tech. And here's another. Never tighten the air cleaner cover wing nut more than finger tight. Over-tightening the wing nut will distort the cover and cause an air and dirt leak. Now, since we're talking about the carburetor, I'd like to mention carburetor icing. Many gasolines have anti-icing additives that retard the formation of carburetor ice. But even so, 
there's still a chance of icing problems during warm-up when weather conditions are just right for it. Carburetor icing can be very annoying. It makes the engine idle roughly and stall during warm-up. Tell me, Chris, just how does carburetor ice form? When fuel is vaporized in the carburetor, it absorbs considerable heat from the air and surrounding metal. If there's a lot of moisture in the air, this moisture will freeze on the throttle valves and bores, even when the outside temperature's way above freezing, choking off the airflow to the engine at idle. This condition can be aggravated and prolonged if the exhaust manifold heat control valve isn't working freely, since this valve is designed to warm up the intake manifold quickly after the engine starts. That's one good reason to use Mopar or Crico manifold heat control valve solvent periodically on both ends of the valve shaft. Yeah, I can understand that. It's not much good to cure a hard starting condition only to ignore poor engine performance during warm-up. I've noticed that 5W20 engine oil is now recommended if minimum temperatures are going to be consistently lower than 10 above zero. That should reduce engine drag and help cranking speed on cold mornings. It's a good idea to follow this recommendation in all recent model engines, Phil. You know, we've covered cold starting and wet starting problems, but what about hot starting? Hot starting problems can be caused by improperly routed fuel lines or filter. So be sure the fuel filter is positioned vertically or at an angle, not horizontally. As you know, refineries change gasoline to match weather conditions, so the engine will have a more volatile fuel for better cold weather starting. But that may cause a problem if the weather suddenly turns warm. If you get summer temperatures in winter, the volatile winter fuel may cause vapor lock. The condition will disappear as soon as it turns cold again, or the winter fuel is used up. Percolation is another problem. To prevent it, carburetors have a vent arrangement that allows fumes caused by heat in the carburetor to pass out into the atmosphere when the engine's not running. But if the vent cover isn't adjusted properly, it may not open. Pressure in the carburetor float chamber will push excess fuel into the manifold. The resulting overrich mixture causes hard, hot starting. Incidentally, winter fuel that's more volatile can aggravate this condition. Okay, Phil. That's how I make sure every link in the chain is set to go when the driver turns the key. This has been quite a lesson in curing starting ailments. Now I know why you were so confident that this engine would start even with that stream of water on it. Absolutely, Phil. If you've done a thorough job, the engine will start every time even under conditions as drastic as those we've just seen. And you'll have another satisfied customer who'll count on your service department to keep his car running dependably year after year. <laughs>